Well, hi there, folks. Uh, welcome to the latest of AAANZ's Table Fellowship webinars. This month's uh, topic is Delete Facebook and Christian Discipleship, a discussion on social media. Unfortunately, when we ran this webinar live, we were trialing new software, and one of the casualties of that uh, attempt uh, was the introduction for the webinar, which was not recorded. So here I am just to repeat that part of the webinar so that you have some context for what it is that, we're, uh, that we talked about. Uh, and the first thing to say is that the idea for this webinar came, I think, from uh, a couple, well, two things. One is that Megan Pal de Troyes, my conversation partner during this webinar, uh, wrote an article called Social Media uh, Spirituality, I think, and uh, it was a really good article, a really great article, and there was a lot uh, to be gained from reading it, and I encourage people to do so. But I also thought that uh, there were some additional things that could be said in response to Megan's uh, work. So I wrote an article in response, um, and rather than just submitting that article, I decided to send it to Megan, who I hadn't met in person, and to just ensure that I had correctly understood what she was saying and I hadn't misrepresented it. And Megan wrote a response to me, and we gathered those things together. We gave them to Ethos, and they were posted on the Ethos blog. So when the delete Facebook <coughs> scandal kind of the story broke back in March of this year, I immediately thought that Megan and I should host a conversation about that topic. And so here we are, that's what we're doing. A little bit about Delete Facebook and the background to this webinar. Uh, in March of this year, the social media giant Facebook was caught up in another of a series of scandals. In this instance, they were accused uh, of allowing the political consulting firm Cambridge Analytica, to, uh, they allowed them to access the data of tens of millions of Facebook users. Cambridge Analytica had, in fact, been collecting data since 2014, and this data was later used in Ted Cruz's presidential campaign, it was used in the 2016 Brexit campaign, and even though they've denied it, there are numerous reports that Cambridge Analytica assisted in Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. There there's conflicting reports about the number of people whose data was uh, was breached. Facebook says 87 million, with 70 million of those living in the US. Cambridge Analytica, however, says only 30 million, although that in itself would be a staggering number. But other experts suggest that the number is higher than both of those estimates. The way that the data collection worked was that people clicked to fill uh, out a personality test that was designed by Alexander Kogan. You know, those kinds of personality tests that you see on Facebook all the time that tells you which Lord of the Rings character you would be and uh, what, uh, what Smurf you should be, or those kinds of things. Uh, stuff like that, right? Uh, maybe not a good idea to click those things. But anyway, Kogan was a lecturer in psychology at Cambridge University. He maybe still is, I don't know. But... Those who filled out the quiz gave Kogan access to their Facebook data, and not only their own Facebook data, but also the Facebook data of everyone in their social network. It was quite exponential in that sense. And so, for example, in Australia, only, uh, well, as far as we know, only 53 people actively completed Kogan's personality test, but Facebook claims that over 300,000 Australians may have had their data breached as a result. Crazy. Kogan eventually sold the data to Cambridge Analytica, which is financed by the hedge fund manager and Republican donor Robert Mercer. The data was used to develop so, uh, psychological profiles for the purpose of creating these you know, highly effective, targeted political uh, advertising campaigns, uh, you know, during political campaigns or whatever. When Facebook discovered the breach, they asked Cambridge Analytica to delete all the data that they 
had collected, but it was reported later that Cambridge Analytica had not, in fact, complied with that request. So when revelations of this data breach came to public attention in March, Facebook, understandably, came under fire. And many people began calling for others to, you know, hashtag delete Facebook. Now, predictably, Facebook apologized numerous times and have said that they're fixing the problems in regard to, you know, protecting data and all the rest. However, Mark Zuckerberg has admitted that fixing these problems will, will take years. And that's if one trusts them to do the right thing in the first place. So the hashtag delete Facebook is, of course, you know, deeply ironic. It's, you know, it's directed against a social media gargantuan. But it's a message that itself relies on social media for transmission. It takes the form of a hashtag, which, you know, is a convention that materialized on social media. And so delete Facebook utilizes both the resources and the literary forms of the very thing that it seeks to supplant. Such confusion, I would argue, is at the heart of much of the dilemma that we face with social media more generally. That is, <laughs> can't live with it and can't live without it. In whatever the case, debate has raged on the internet as to whether deleting Facebook is a good idea. There's also been much commentary on the political nature of social media platforms, especially Facebook, and their effects on political life around the world. And of course, this is only the most recent threads of a public conversation about social media that's been going on for like over a decade. What effect does social media have on individuals and communities? What is it doing to our brains? What is it doing to our lives? What is it doing to our relationships? And, and what are the strengths of social media for activism and organizing and for hearing otherwise marginalized voices and perhaps most relevant in this context or certainly most relevant in this context what does social media mean for christian discipleship indeed what what does christian discipleship require from us in our use of social media now in the webinar that follows we couldn't possibly hope to answer all those questions um, but hopefully this provides a pretty useful and maybe even a thoughtful starting point for future conversations, conversations that we agree that we desperately need to have. So at this point, I, I want to hand over to Megan, um, to, to start off with her perspective on this whole thing. Megan, do you have some stuff you want to share from your screen? Uh, I will perhaps as I go on, but not straight away. Oh, you let me know and I'll just switch it over. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, well, for those who don't know me, um, I'm Megan Powell Dutois, uh, an ordained Baptist minister. I live in Sydney. So I'm ordained with Baptist New South Wales and the ACT. And yes, that is the mouthful that you have to say. Um, I work for the Australian College of Theology as a publishing manager. And I edit the academic journal Colloquium, which is the journal of ANZATS, which is the Australian and New Zealand Association of Theological Schools. I'm currently completing my PhD in theology, which is about how evangelicals deal with theological difference. Uh, so social media actually comes into my PhD um, as we look at that as a current way that we negotiate difference. Um, and my background is as a pastor, uh, a lecturer, and an editor, so all of that comes together with what I currently do. Now, my social media background, um, I joined Facebook pretty early in 2007, and I initially did that, I was a pastor to keep in touch with my congregation who were mostly young adults. Um, I also now use Twitter, which I still not sure I understand, um, Instagram, the that I made today, um, LinkedIn, which bores me, uh, and Pinterest, which I think is not so social anymore. And Facebook is my favourite, and many people think I'm addicted. So that's just in uh, a full disclosure kind of way. Um, in fact, yeah, someone said I'm the Baptist voice that they see most on um, 
social media, which uh, I think is a, um, yeah, <laughs> double-edged sword. Um, I like Facebook because I find it more relational for me uh, than the other social media, um, and I'm a very relational person. And also, I have experienced it, and many people have a different experience, but I've experienced it as a place where ideas can be exchanged and um, we can actually have a real conversation. Uh, but that takes some effort. Uh, in terms of my more um, official kind of interaction with social media, uh, I have been writing about it, um, and it's particularly its interception with theology and ministry and discipleship and so on uh, for quite some time. And uh, I actually look back, and the first time I wrote on it uh, was for Zadok Perspectives Journal, which is the Journal of Evangelical Alliance in 2011, so seven years ago, which made me feel old. Um, and that was on social media and apologetics. I've also written on social media with regards to spirituality, spiritual disciplines, and Christian unity. Um, I am, better or worse, the author of the current New South Wales and ACT Baptist social media policy, um, because I was thought someone who was a bit younger, <laughs> more into it. I'm in my 40s, by the way, so that was kind of amusing to me. Um, and I now, for work, run or co-run two social media accounts. So I, I run the one for Stone College of Theology and the one for Colloquium, um, which I edit, obviously. So I have to be on social media for work and I have to try and understand it for work. And also both the accounts that I have are um, Christian ones, so I have to use it in a Christian way or at least way that uh, serves the purposes of the particular Christian organisations that I work for, which is not necessarily the same as the Christian way, if you like. Um, so for me, and just to state it right up front, I the way that I write about it is um, a little bit different from many, the way many other Christians are approaching it, in that I'm often quite focused on how we do social media as Christians. While Megan's coming back, uh, it probably just uh, will save time later if I maybe introduce myself as well. Um, so some of you, uh, if you, especially if you're a regular to these, you'll know me anyway, because um, I usually host these webinars. Uh, but my name is Matt Anslow, and <coughs> excuse me, I am uh, currently I serve as the vice president of the Anabaptist Association of Australia and New Zealand. So that's my role uh, in relation to these webinars. But in relation to this topic, um, there's probably a few things that are relevant. Uh, as I mentioned before, I, for a few years, I was the social media manager, or well, that was part of my role, I should say, for uh, Tier Australia, which is a, uh, a aid and development uh, NGO. And so spent a lot of time on <laughs> social media, which I didn't always enjoy. And I'll tell a bit of an anecdote about that later. <laughs> uh, which will explain why I no longer do that job. But uh, I also have been heavily involved over the last sort of four years with the social media <coughs> management of Love Makes A Way. Love Makes A Way is an organization that has uh, essentially advocated for uh, people who are seeking asylum uh, in Australia, especially using the tools of nonviolence and civil disobedience and that kind of thing. And so uh, there's been a lot of, you know, we've reached uh, hundreds of thousands of, Austral of Australians on social media. Hello, I'm just introducing myself while, <laughs> while you come back. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry, so, I have the NBN and enough said. Yes, yeah. I think I, it's my internet, we yes. We have satellite NBN. That's why I'm on using my mobile phone for internet at the moment. Mm. So uh, just quickly uh, to finish off, um, yeah, so our, my work with Love Makes A Way, and we've been able to reach hundreds of thousands of Australians with our messages using social media. So we've been able to use it positively. Um, I suspect that in this webinar, Megan is going to take the good cop and I'm going to take the bad cop uh, role. <laughs> but we'll just see how that pans out. Uh, before I hand back over, folks, if you have any questions as the thing goes on, please feel free <coughs> to throw them straight into the chat. Um, I can come back to them. Or if I feel like they're relevant and I should interrupt, um, either Megan or myself, I can do that too. So uh, please feel free to write down questions now or, or you know, if you want to save them up till later, that's also fine. Uh, maybe just write them down so you don't forget them. 
Megan. Okay, so I dumb introduction. Um, I guess there's sort of three basic ways to approach it is to give up on online social media interaction, um, to limit or manage it in some way, um, or adopt, uh, this is a Christian, or adopt a, a sort of active, deliberate posture of uh, difference in how you use it, I think. And that's kind of what I am doing, the third option. Uh, so I've never fasted from social media, except unintentionally, <laughs> when I had no Wi-Fi. Um, and maybe that's a problem, but that's the way that I've approached how I understand the really complex uh, situation that we're in. First is look at um, some of the arguments for not because uh, I dismiss those out of hand. I'll categorise those into. I'll I'll start my part of the presentation, and then um, we can uh, come back to Megan's part after if she can get some decent internet. Um, so for me, as I mentioned, I'm kind of the bad cop. Uh, of of the situ of of this uh, presentation, and the primary theme on which I want to concentrate is um, is that of the corporate nature of social media. So, I think Megan is going to you know Megan will be talking. Hopefully, we can get her to talk about um, some of the different dynamics on Facebook and how we should relate to them as, as Christians and how we can do essentially social media better. I just want to talk about what's going on in the background. Um, from my research and all that kind of stuff um, so that we have a sense of what it is that we're getting into when we use social media and then we can hopefully be more wise and discerning in the way that we use it. So it's more common for people to point out, um, uh, to point this out in recent months but the fact is that many of us habitually use social media without a, a thought for the fact that it's a corporate creation uh, designed to do the bidding of of corporations, and that might sound a bit dramatic, kind of like something from uh, a conspiracy theory film. But unfortunately, truth is sometimes stranger, or at least uh, more troubling than uh, than 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 fiction. And part of the concern here is, of course, that um, social media uh, <clears throat> platforms are collecting our data and often breaching our privacy. So the mobilization around Delete Facebook is a sign that this concern around data collection and privacy is becoming more prevalent as data breach scandals become more common and more disconcerting. But data collection, I, I want to let you know, is only the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's a scary one in and of itself, but it's only a part of what's going on. After all, Consider the purpose of data collection. Like, why why are they do it? Why are these platforms collecting this data? Well, the acquisition of data serves to help the owners of the various social media platforms and their partners to increase their effectiveness at, of course, earning profit. The fact is that data collection is just a symptom of a deeper uh, of the deeper capitalistic forces at play. Now, I'm not <coughs> going to talk about capitalism per se, uh, I'm not particularly qualified for that, but the person who is, is John Cornford, whose uh, webinar recording from two months ago, you should definitely watch because it is genuinely amazing. So I'm not concerned to talk about capitalism, but I am concerned to note the way in which social media platforms and big tech brands more generally are quickly becoming fronts for vast multinational monopolies and we could call them empires. And this applies to more than uh, Facebook. You know, think of Google and Amazon and Apple. Together with Facebook, they're called, you know, the four. Uh, but you also have other smaller ones like Uber and Airbnb and Spotify and Netflix and so forth. All companies that offer some helpful service but that also earn a killing for doing so. The profit that these companies earn... it. It might not be inherently evil, although I, it's quite debatable, I think. Um, but it does present such companies with the opportunity to concentrate power, to control ideas and information, uh, to dodge public accountability, for example, regulations and taxes, and to influence even political outcomes, as we've seen. All of this is somewhat ironic, because if we think back to 10 years ago, it was the these visionary heads of these companies who were... 
they were pretty much all but tearful at the liberational possibilities of their, te- of their technologies. Uh, they, they said that they would break down the walls between people and both information and relationships and undo the power of the gatekeepers to control what we see and what we hear. Now, if we think about it in our time, Apparently, they have become those same gatekeepers, and they might even be more dangerous ones. Indeed, in their time, power seems to have shifted away from representative politics towards capital more than ever. And the problems go even beyond profit, to the fact that all technology, whether it's social media or otherwise, hey, Megan, I'm just doing my presentation, so... uh, Sit back, relax, and, and I'll switch back to you soon. Okay, I've gone on to mobile data as well, so we're yes. good for the telcos. Yeah, yeah. Good, 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 <laughs> loving it. We're, we're hopefully back on track, folks. So, like I said, it goes beyond profit. So, the fact that all technology embodies certain values, it's, this is not just related to social media, but it certainly does relate to social media. No form of technology is neutral. Even before they earned a single dollar of profit, the creators of the world's biggest social media platforms developed their technologies based on some set of values. And so we end up with microwaves and cars. This isn't obviously social media, but we end up with microwaves and cars because we value speed. And we end up with email and mobile phones because we value convenience and ease of communication. And And we end up with music streaming services because we like convenience and choice and apparently not paying much for things and so forth. In each of these cases and in countless more, there was a significant amount of disruption that took place. Cars disrupted the sale and use of horses, which might not be a bad thing, although it may, I don't know. Email disrupted the postal system. Uh, Music streaming services disrupted the music industry. Now we can debate the merits of any of that, but the fact is that these these technologies are disruptive. And the difference with social media is not that it's simply a technology that happens to disrupt uh, to disrupt a pre-existing industry as some, you know, unfortunate effect of technological uh, progress. No, it's more than that. Social media is itself the embodiment of disruption. And I mean this in at least two ways. First, that social media nowadays grows out of the entrepreneur spirit of Silicon Valley. It's here that we find a contemporary libertarian blend of cultural progressivism on the one hand and free market profit-driven fervor on the other. And that kind of appetite for progress and profit means the disruption and even the demolition of older industries and associations. It's not just about um, industry either. It's about, it's, it is about our associations. It's about what it means even to be human in some, in some respects. You know, in that regard, I think we have more to worry about with AI, uh, artificial intelligence, and with transhumanism or, or posthumanism, uh, both of which threaten to <laughs> redefine humanity and existence themselves, but I digress. Um, the second kind of disruption that I'd want to mention is, <clears throat> or talk about, is that it becomes uh, disruption becomes necessary for the constant growth of these social media companies and other big tech companies and so consider the level of disruption to people's lives that occurs at the hands of social media and other uh, other tech corporations and some will say well let, you know thinking about for example social uh, social media addiction which is a huge issue and some will say that social media addiction which is ever increasing, is the responsibility of the user. It's your responsibility not to get addicted. And that certainly is a consideration. We can't avoid that. However, like many forms of addiction, social media addiction, it's it's an intentional strategy of its beneficiaries. It should not shock us that many social media companies hire psychologists and people familiar with the techniques of the Las, uh, Las Vegas gambling industry. It's not an accident that people get addicted. The aim is to create addicts, to increasingly disrupt their lives, punctuating those lives with more and more adverts and opportunities to give away data, all with the power of harnessing that dopamine hit that we get when we get the notification. When we look at the little glowing rectangle and it tells us that somebody loves us, 
And so Sean Parker, the Napster creator and one of the founding presidents of Facebook, admitted recently that Facebook was designed to be addictive. And he said this, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. I think that was in an interview with Forbes or one of those big American magazines. I can't remember. Um, (coughs) But Facebook has experimented with what it can do to us. Just to use one example, in the last couple of years, there were reports that the company experimented with the algorithms that control the content people see on their walls. And the aim of that was to influence their emotions. That, think about that for a second. Facebook was able to quantitatively work out whether or not they could control people's emotions based on what they showed them and then how they responded uh, in their posts. Imagine how that affects the relationship between social media and advertising. Imagine if social media platforms can control your emotions, can, or at least influence your emotions, I should say, and then sell advertising space on the basis of those things. That's a, that is a scary possibility, I think. I, I used to work, as I said, for an NGO managing their social media platforms. And given what I've shared, I'm not sure... <laughs> I'm not sure I was the right person for the job, but um, that's where I found myself. And much of the time, I was given content to share and other materials to promote. And every quarterly report that I had to write, I would find myself writing pretty much the same thing. In fact, by the end, I was copying and pasting it between every report. (coughs) And it would say something like this. By publishing content on social media, we are entering the social spaces of our supporters. True, they have opted into this by following our social media accounts. But everything we share robs those people of their mental energy, even if only slightly. We have a responsibility to ensure that our social media content is worthy of that disruption. Because if it is not, we are potentially stealing attention that they might otherwise give to important things. So unsurprisingly, I was made redundant from that job in 2016, but... (laughs) My point back then seems even more relevant now. The fact is that social media is increasingly distracting people from the rest of their lives, and this this is intentional. Uh, It's not merely uh, an anecdotal claim, by the way. I'm not just basing this off what what I see. There's plenty of data out there showing that social media users are not only more distracted on average, but they're also less happy, they're lonelier, and they're increasingly anxious and depressed. And of course, people who regularly use social media are able to be more easily influenced by the control of ideas and information that those platforms hold. It's not simply presidential elections that can be swayed, although that's scary enough. Although not, it's not that strange, is it? I mean, newspapers have been doing that forever as well. So, you know, it's not entirely strange. But what social media platforms do is they are able to control the very things, or to a certain extent, the very things that we value and the way that we interact with one another. Now, social media may, may provide a platform for the Me Too movement and Love Makes a Way and the Occupy movement, but it also provides an incubator for the men's, right, the men's rights movement and incels, uh, what's it called, involuntarily celibate people. Um, look at, <laughs> what, like me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, that's an invoke, folks. <laughs> I accuse Megan of... No, I'm not... Uh, yeah, no, she's married. It's just... and uh, From what I understand, the marriage is good. So... <laughs> put that joke aside. Sorry. Um, and and <laughs> it also incubates the confidence of on, uh, anonymous online abusers of women and minorities. Uh, and as we all become dehumanized by these forces, reduced to just these sort of containers of data, we find that we treat one another as less than human in the way that we interact. Perhaps the best way to describe social media is as a great big experiment. And we just don't know what the results of that experiment are gonna be. Now, what does all this mean for discipleship? A whole bunch of things. (laughs) Uh, But first of all, I'd wanna point out that uh, the church is already being affected. For example, (laughs) I was recently reading a BBC article about research into mobile-based Bibles. 
many of us would have those on our phones. Um, and the way that those Bibles are displacing, you know, paper Bibles. <clears throat> the effect of this, uh, the effect, claimed the research, was that people are reading the Bible in smaller and smaller portions and are less conscious of the overall structure, which, you know, you, you sort of get more of a sense of when you have a Bible, a bit, you know, a book in your hand. <coughs> and so this results, apparently, in people reading the Bible more like Wikipedia, just sort of thumbing through it for information rather than as a large narrative with different genres and themes. The researchers suggest that this may all lead to people picking and choosing what they like, even more than before, apparently, uh, and also to more fundamentalist readings of the Bible. That's what they claim. Now, it's only one example, of course, but it demonstrates that we need to be more thoughtful about how we approach technology and, and, and more thoughtful in regard to how we disciple others in light of technology. Uh, second, we, we need to exercise discernment in all things, and this includes social media. We certainly should not adopt new practices without thoughtfulness and prayer, though I suspect that this is what most of us, including me, have done with regard to social media. We, we probably got an account without even thinking about it, certainly in my case because someone else created an account because I was a stubbornly late adopter. But um, even so, I took on that account and didn't even think about it. Now, we need to remember, I think, that social media is not a necessity. At base level, I think it's a form of entertainment. You don't have to use it. Because social media use is so prevalent in our society, we're prone to forget that, I think. There's nothing forcing us to use this product, and it is a product, uh, any more than we're forced to read newspapers or buy chewing gum. You, you, don't have, you can say no, and your life won't be any worse. Third, if we do decide to use social media, for any number of valid reasons, I am a user of social media, so despite my bad cop routine, uh, I'm not saying not to use it. I'm just saying we need to do so very carefully. There are numerous things that we could say about that, but here's a couple that I've got on the screen there. One is that we should seek to treat people well on social media. I mean, this is so obvious, right? This is so baseline. But it's also really difficult sometimes. Social media companies reduce us all, as I said, to these containers of data. And it's no wonder that social media platforms can easily cause us to forget that the people with whom we converse are not merely just ones and zeros. They're actually real people. Jesus' command to do unto others is a, it's a good starting point, right? And we should all probably print it out and tape it to the top of our computers. And preferably, by the way, over your webcam, which is a really good privacy-protecting practice. So, you know, you're two birds, one stone. Um, we should also refuse to be uh, reduced to data, to be exploited, and and, re and and refuse to be reduced to avatars with which uh, with which we you know might imbibe a, a false identity, and we should refuse to reduce others in the same way. We need to we need to say no to things sometimes. The other thing is we should refuse to let social media master us. And here I'm thinking of First Corinthians uh, six, uh, especially verse twelve. As I've mentioned, addiction is a significant risk of using social media platforms. Um, they're like having a slot machine in your pocket all the time. And we should do whatever is necessary to not be overwhelmed by that power. And one strategy is certainly fasting, which Megan mentioned before. Now, uh, if you head over to the Ethos blog and look at my conversation with Megan, there's quite a bit of, I've, I've written a little bit about fasting there, um, which I think is profitable, hopefully. Um, but all I'll say is <coughs> fasting is not about withdrawing. Rather, fasting is a practice that causes us to detach from things in order to master our desires and to see all things in their proper place. You know, we fast from food so that our physical hunger is trained and that it doesn't master us and to learn to recognize God's goodness and just to see food in its proper place, not as our master, but as our slave, if you will. And the same goes with social media fasting. By switching off, we say no to the desire to get that dopamine hit from getting notifications. And we see social media and technology in their proper place as slaves and not masters. Thomas Merton writes, um, 
We do not detach ourselves from things in order to attach ourselves to God, but rather we become detached from ourselves in order to see and use all things in and for God. It's about detaching primarily from those desires to get the notification or whatever it is. Now, I've a practice that I've dropped back on in the last few months since I moved to the farm here, but that I did practice for the most of 2017 uh, was a regular social media fast. And for me, this meant not using social media or screens actually at all on Mondays and Saturdays. Um, unsurprisingly, they were my most productive days and also the days that I was least distracted when spending time with my family or with God or, or whatever. And preparing for this webinar has inspired me to return to this practice. I'm not entirely sure why I dropped it, actually, but um, I, I think that I should go back to that. And also the practice of logging out of my accounts after every use. So, you know, with your social media accounts, you can just say, remember me. And so when you hit Facebook on your browser, it just goes onto your account. Well, I, I'm now practicing just logging out every time I finish so that I can't just click the button. I have to type my stupid password and, and do all that. It just discourages me from habitual use. Uh, fourth, la and lastly, um, we have to engage on social media uh, rightly and proportionately. And I, I know the advocacy power of social media firsthand, right? I know that it's powerful. Uh, love makes a way and all that. And, you know, like I said, we can think of Occupy or Me Too or countless other campaigns or messages that have been disseminated largely through social media. But we should not fall into the trap of thinking that the primary role of the church is to advocate for these causes. In the words of Stanley Howarth, uh, the, the church does not exist to make the world more just, but to make the world the world. Now, that's a, actually a really complicated statement, uh, and he has been attacked mercilessly for it, and he's had to actually explain what he means. But if I had to describe what, uh, sum, summarize what Howarth is saying, basically he's just saying uh, that, the church exists uh, as a unique community in the world that, is a, that witnesses to the world in such a way that the world understands that the church is different and that the world could be like the church. So we may work for justice in innumerable ways, and Anabaptists are deeply passionate about the work of justice and peace, right? But this is an aspect of a deeper vocation to be God's unique community of Jesus following people in the world. We do justice because that's what following Jesus is like. Following Jesus is not simply equated with justice. So we just need to be careful that we don't think that we're, we're, we're doing the mission of God by advocating for justice causes or whatever on Facebook. We cannot excuse disorder in our lives on the basis of our work for this or that cause. Social media activism is no replacement for, for participating in flesh and blood signs that point to the kingdom. You know, it's too easy to focus on engagement via social media and to neglect our responsibilities to our flesh and blood neighbours in our midst. So despite everything I've said, I'm not opposed to using social media. <laughs> uh, like I said, I first met Megan on social media, uh, on Facebook, so that's a good enough reason <laughs> to use it, really. But like anything in life... is so beneficial. Well, <laughs> I, you said it, so... But like anything in life, we need to think through whether social media is good for us, both personally and as communities, because some people will decide that it's a bad idea for them to use social media. And that's completely legitimate. And you need to feel uh, okay with saying no and, and saying, I don't have to use it. That's fine. But we have to think through whether it's good for us, how we engage rightly with it, and how this engagement affects other areas of our lives, including our participation. In God's mission. So at this point, I'm going to hand, uh, uh, I'll go over to that later, hand back over to Megan. Uh, so I'll turn off my webcam and Megan can have a bit of a yarn with you all. Hi, can everyone hear me? Good. Uh, so I'll just work out where I was up to. And uh, just as I was listening to you, it was interesting. Um, I was thinking where we end up is actually not that different, but we arrived there in different ways, uh, which is an interesting process in itself, I think, to see that. Um, okay, so I was saying that the things that you've mentioned, so cyberbullying, anxiety, depression, envy, uh, poor sleep quality, self-esteem issues, addiction, um, which has lots of flow on 
effects. I think they are, there's enough research to show they are definite negative effects. So I, I wouldn't want to take away from that. And they're all good reasons to limit or manage or go off uh, social media completely. Um, but they are personal. They will not be the complete experience of all, all people. Uh, so for instance, one example for me is that dopamine effect that you're talking about. The way that I am constructed as a person, um, I am not, I'm not motivated by people I don't know. So I don't really get that from numbers of hits on anything that I write or anything like that. Um, I get motivated by people I know and the interaction with me. Um, so that kind of cushions me a bit. I know I have other problems that cause addiction that I need to be aware of, but that, that's a personal difference where that doesn't affect me as much. Um, I think also there is a way that social media, and I think I said this in my piece that you responded to, Matt, that it, it becomes a mirror that's worth uh, using. Because uh, a lot of the times when people talk to me about uh, what uh, they don't like about it and negative effects of it, it actually brings up things that I think to myself, well, but why is that occurring for you? Why have you got that emotion? Is that something you need to look at? So things like envy or um, self-esteem issues or so on. I think it um, it really becomes uh, something that reveals to us perhaps areas of ourselves that in other um, areas of our life we're managing to ignore. Uh, so I think that we you need to also see it as a growth tool in that way rather than necessarily go, oh, I'm feeling negative from my experience of social media, so therefore I need to get off it. And negative effect may be in fact something that makes you think okay why am I having this negative effect how am I contributing to it um, rather than just disengaging uh, it's also known to have uh, positive personal results uh, access to information access to different voices development of empathy is um, comes through social media uh, for some people removal of isolation being able to join in public political discourse and so on um, and in fact when I was looking at this uh, there was a Psychology Today article uh, in February this year, which I think made a really good distinction about this as to why some people have negative effects and some people have positive effects. And it said that, in fact, the research is showing now, when it's looked at uh, more um, uh, minutely, is that it's not really a distinction between how much you're on so much as how you use it, whether you're a passive user or an active user of um, social media. And so. I'm always um, advocating a, an active reflective use um, of social media. And I think that that, I would never want to advocate just a, a passive consumption, probably of anything, uh, particularly of social media. Um, so relational, again, as you've brought up, um, it can have bad impact on our offline relationships. I think it also can have bad impact on our online uh, relationships. I know with um, some people that, there was a great offline relationship and then when we added an online relationship, problems occurred. Sometimes I think it was because we actually didn't know each other that well. Um, sometimes I think it was because one of us wasn't using social media that well. So again, I think there can be an oversimplistic idea of, oh, it's affected this relationship. Well, why has it affected the relationship? What do I need to learn or the other person, or both of us need to learn about that? Um, now, this is where I confess, I recently had a conversation with my husband about my overuse of social media um, because it certainly does affect that relationship. Um, but that ended up being quite a helpful uh, conversation because we also talked about, and I'm going to talk more about this, my ministry on social media and how he responds to that and how we understand what I do on social media and what I'm doing with it. Um, and that was a really fruitful conversation. So again, it's, it's a complicated thing and also was about him respecting that as not necessarily just a waste of time. Um, and me also then respecting what he's communicating to me about it. Uh, so again, there are known uh, positive effects of social media relationships, um, of positive social connection, finding people who've got similar circumstances and interests. Also, um, if you use it in a particular way, of, of getting more well-rounded pictures of other people and so therefore being less inclined to other them. Uh, and then a personal note, I found it really invaluable when I was a pastor for knowing how my congregation were going. Um, and certainly some of them found it easier to talk to me online than face to face um, and I took advantage of that. And uh, as Matt was saying, I've developed some great friendships and creative partnerships uh, through online relationships and, um, and it does have this ability to get you outside of your geography and other circles, which I think is fantastic. 
Um, I would not want, there's several relationships that I find so key to my spirituality um, and my emotional support and that I, I would be very upset if I had not had those. Um, so now looking more at the social justice uh, aspect and I think with Matt and I think Delete Facebook has really uh, forced me to think about my attitude towards social media because I feel like this is the strongest argument against social media use. Um, that for most of the most popular social media tools or sites, they are owned by fair, large, fairly unaccountable corporate interests. And of course, those corporations use our data and direct the usage of their tools in ways that suit them, um, which is totally self-interested and often invidious. Uh, and they, they sell on our data to even less ethical groups, as we've seen. Uh, and that is a real problem. And this can have far-reaching negative effects on society as a whole. It affects votes and governance of nations, as we've seen. It can create greater tribalism. Uh, and then I think also, as Christians, we should always do, do due diligence on any um, group or corporation or so on um, or service that we're interacting with. Uh, do they have, in general, ethical business practices? Uh, um, however, and this is probably where I depart a little bit from uh, Matt and how I envisage this, that when I'm trying to think about social media, uh, I don't actually see it as completely a product. I think that's one way to envisage it. However, I think we need to also recognise that they're also communities. And that makes a very distinct um, ethical dilemma, I think, for us when it comes to interacting with them. So it isn't the same to boycott social media as it is to say boycott a fashion company. Um, I can just wear other clothes. But if I boycott Facebook, for instance, I suddenly remove myself from a large global community and many sub-communities within it. And so I need to think about, and I might decide it's, it's justified, but I need to think about the impact of a communal withdrawal in that way. Um, and I also need to think about, in terms of the benefits of social media, whether you can get a wide reach social media that is not in some way enabled by a large corporate body. Um, our large corporate bodies are unavoidable evil, and I'll come back to that. So what do I do if I want to be part of social media communities for good reasons? And moreover, if in fact all Christians were to say social media is evil and or, or many of them and disconnect themselves, what happens to those communities? Do they become communities that are in some sense therefore unreached by the gospel or unable to be affected by the salt and light um, of the Christian community uh, in the way that Matt was talking about? Uh, because I, I kind of refuse to see these communities as in some way not communities. Um, I think they're different, but they're still, for me, viable, real communities uh, that we need to be, and, and connected into offline communities as well. And I think, therefore, um, we need to have a, a, a missional idea of those communities just as we have with our offline communities. And that, for me, actually becomes really crucial to how I approach social media. Um, now, I did a bit of a what would Jesus do experiment on this, which is a bit cheesy, um, but a good thought experiment. And I thought about um, the turning over the tables in the temple came to mind, but also partying with sinners. And I was trying to think, what, how would Jesus respond to a social media environment? Um, and not in a simplistic way, but if you're wanting to turn over the, the sort of the money grubbing tendencies and what they occur, and I think he would be worried about that. But also, would he want to engage with those communities despite uh, the problems of, of doing so uh, in order to reach people where they are, which dramatically people are on Facebook. And I do think, uh, I personally can't see that Jesus would have completely absented himself from social media. I think it is, for me, a place for mission that, and people that I need to minister to. Um, and I also think, and Matt's brought this up, I think it becomes also a subversive environment that there are ways that the social media giants and governments even want us to use the sites, but then there are ways that humans do, and humans are incredibly uh, inventive and hard to control, uh, more so than we think. And that's why totalitarian governments do not like social media um, or ones not under their control. And I think that there's, and I particularly see this as a woman, I think, um, that there is a democratising um, effect of social media, enabling those with less power to impact and change thought and society. And 
for me, Me Too is something that would not have been possible without social media and yet I think is one of the most crucial movements that I have seen as a woman um, in my lifetime. I think it's it's changing something that absolutely needed changing and I'm not sure it would have happened without social media. Um, and I think that that has become more the case that when we're looking at online thought, blogs no longer cut it. Um, people don't read them anymore. People get linked to them from um, social media. So that um, social media has become quite crucial for disseminating thought. Um, and what I like about social media is that it is much more of a conversation rather than a monologue. And, um, and that's what I like about Facebook. I actually like that we have disagreements on Facebook. I think disagreements are necessary. Um, I even don't mind sometimes that they get a bit heated, unlike some other people. I don't think that we should run away from something because it got heated. I think we then need to look at why that emotion occurred and how we're going to deal with it. Okay, but to come back to my idea of social media as ministry, um, this really has grown on me as my self-conception of what I'm doing with social media. Uh, I initially did it as a pastor for my young adult community and it was also a lifeline for me as someone with small children. Um, but it's actually because other people have thanked me for my social media ministry and I've gone, oh, okay, thanks. Um, and then gone, is that what I'm doing? Is it a ministry? Um, and here's the things that people have thanked me for. And this has made me quite reflective on it. People have thanked me for being a female Christian voice, for being an unafraid Christian voice, for being an ironic, peaceful Christian voice, for someone being someone who speaks about uncomfortable issues and someone who engages with online Christian debate thoughtfully and compassionately and bravely. Now, I don't always do that, but that's what people have said. Now, all of that takes time and effort, and I don't think that's necessarily for everyone. Um, so I think that that's a point where you go, is this the space for me to be engaging or is this for someone else? So I've, I've deliberately made that decision. It takes support from other people for me. Um, it takes a lot of management of my own emotions. So it certainly takes up time. And it, it takes a lot of development of my own self-discipline. Um, but all those things that people ask me to do, when I hear that, I think, yeah, I actually think that that needs to happen. I think we need female Christian voices, people who they often don't have enough institutional voice. We need Christian voices that speak against some of the status quo. Um, we need that ability to talk across the tribalism in Christian circles. And I think that I've made a lot more connections outside my own tribe through social media. And that's been, for me, a really, really important um, thing that I am able to do. Um, that's one thing. That's one part of ministry. Uh, it's the online community. And then I think I've also got a, a ministry to um, non-Christian community in a way that I've joined um, like a polit political commentary Facebook group and um, I'm in a podcast group which is very heavily laden with um, left-leaning educated women. And um, actually find these are really important places for me as a Christian to speak into to to show a different way that people might have their perception of being Christian and I find um, that uh, quite apart from people's normal idea of how people respond to Christian things that they're really interested in my Christian articles um, and, and and also my friends who aren't Christian and actually able to talk about my spirituality in a way that I am unable to in any other context that I'm in um, <laughs> How do, we do, how do we do discipleship? I think when I get to this point is when I'm going to say very similar things to Matt. Um, I think that we need to deliberately resist the tribalism of social media. We should use it to expand our circles. I do something which is really hard. I extremely rarely unfriend or unfollow. Um, I interact with people different from, from me. Um, I try not always successfully to do so in a way that genuinely converses and, and listens. I try to um, be relational, like introduce myself. I bring up commonalities. I say, hey, you seem to know this person. I make it like how we expect um, offline relationships to go. Um, I think we also need to think through those harms and how we can ameliorate those harms. We're not sort of go, oh, well, they're just going to exist no matter what. I think we need to think through how do we bring pressure to bear on the corporations that own the social media. Um, one example I've heard by uh, a guy called Nathan Schneider is to have social media co-ops. Um, I'm kind of a little bit not sure that's going to work, but if it works, fine, I'm going to buy into it. Um, he was also the person, if you've heard of it, who suggested the buy Twitter movement, that he was suggesting that users of Twitter should 
fight back. Uh, however, more realistically, I think things like um, there's a guy called Bernard Lee who's got something called the Solid Project, which he's actually advocating that there's a, a way that we can have a pod that we carry our data around in that actually secures it away from all the other platforms that we use. Um, I think thinking more innovatively like that is some of the stuff that we're going to need to do in the future as we come to terms with this new technology. And the other thing I've heard people talk about is forcing um, in some way these uh, social media sites to use um, public interest algorithms and so on. So I think we can think about it in a way that's much more um, sophisticated than some of the overall ones that we've had. And the other thing I think we need to do um, is increase digital literacy and particularly understanding of digital rhetoric. I think we can combat fake news if we understand what it does and we need to do that by teaching our children and we need to teach our churches. And I think what we're doing at the moment is, is one way of doing that. Um, and we need to actually use those very platforms like Facebook in order to do that um, corporate uh, learning about uh, this new technology and how we exist on it. And we need to do research, we need to do academic research on how um, the digital environment works. And we need particularly Christian research and thinking on that, like we're doing at the moment. And I think that we can't neglect that responsibility to be um, thoughtfully reflective on it. And then finally, I think what all of us would agree about, that you, if you're going to use social media, you have to commit to being different, to being Christ online, to being reflective and thoughtful and self-sacrificial and other-centred and transparent and real, like I deliberately share unattractive things about myself, um, which there are a lot of, because I think that we need to try and combat um, a lot of that, that fakeness or that avatar likeness that we can get through social media. And um, therefore, I think actually it calls us to something quite difficult that not a lot of it, not everyone will have the time to, and so not, maybe not everyone should do it. Uh, but for those of us who do have a calling to that, I think it actually can be really valuable. And that's me, and I'm hoping we've got some time to still engage with each other. Uh, we certainly do. Um, even, I mean, even if uh, things had not run uh, a bit late because of all the tech issues, we've still got sort of 15 or so minutes in the program time. And then if people want to stick around for a bit longer, I reckon we can extend it out till seven. And if people need to leave, that's fine. So um, we are recording. Yeah, I have to go at seven because I've got friends coming over. I've got offline. And friends coming over. Oh, that's good. To <laughs> but I can go until then. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, if you've got questions, uh, I'm. I'd encourage you to start typing them up. I just want to start. Um, Mark and Mary and your group up there in uh, the northern beaches of Sydney. I um, see your question, and I'll get to that in a second. But I want to just begin with uh, David's question. Uh, well, it's really a, a comment, and I'll I'll ask you to comment on this, Megan. He says, "What Megan is saying is the primary reason." why I remain on social media platforms. Private Facebook groups enable a sense of community, connection, and support. For instance, I'm part of a number of private groups for men who are trying to take the inner journey, uh, inner journey seriously. They are amazing safe spaces for men from across the country to share incredibly vulnerably what is going on for them and receive deep and heartfelt support. They are the antithesis of the men's rights and incel stuff and Facebook makes them possible. Okay, um, I'm in to that, David. I am actually in the counterpart of that um, with Tammy, who's in this webinar as well, um, in some women's groups on uh, Facebook. And I found them, like they actually regularly uh, reduce me to tears. Um, they are incredible uh, places for support of women that a lot of them don't have that kind of support or voices um, or women that they feel that they can connect with about their spiritual journey um, in their own contexts. Um, but Facebook has provided a place for that, so absolutely. And I want to say the thing about, because I thought about this and I forgot about it, um, the men's right incel stuff, is that I have some Facebook friends who are perilously close to men's rights activists um, and I keep them around. I, I deliberately don't unfollow them. I interact with them and uh, look, I feel like I need to be there in order to present to them someone who's the kind of person that, that they're kind of othering but to go, actually, I'm a real person. Um, and, in fact, they tend to like all my funny statuses, but if that keeps them following me, all to the good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, well, I'm, I'm, I don't disagree with any of that. I, I, I think that's right. I think, I think it's, um, I think it would be maybe, maybe not ignorant, but something just short of ignorant <laughs> to argue that Facebook or other social media sites offer nothing of value. Um, and there certainly are people who think that, um, that they are only, you know, breed badness, uh, Certainly, they provide a platform for, as, as we've talked about, marginalised voices. Um, certainly, they provide a platform for people to meet who might not be able to meet locally very easily. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to say that, oh, couldn't we just do these things offline? Couldn't we just form these kinds of groups? And to a certain extent, you could. But that's also the privilege of living, say, in cities, if you don't live in a big city or you happen to live in a big city and you're not connected to a good community in that city, finding those kind of kinds of groups of support can be quite difficult. And social media does make it quite a bit easier in that regard. You can find groups of like-minded people or um, groups of uh, people who will support you in difficult situations that would be that might be quite difficult to find offline in your local place. Mm-hmm. Now, in saying that, I I do wish that local churches in their very offline <laughs> embodiment were better at offering these kinds of spaces, places, whatever we want to call them. Um, I think people will go online because pre- precisely because they can't find them offline. Um, there is a huge opening there for offline relationship too. And we need to recognise that um, and see the interplay, I think, between the offline and the online, while, as we've talked about, being very careful of the possibilities of uh, all the bad things that can happen online too. So that's a really good comment, Cookie. Thanks for that. Um, Mark and Mary and their group, I'm not sure who in that group but uh, said this, but what about children and social media? What are the dangers? What are the benefits? Um, I, I have children. I've got a 13 year old who's now on Facebook. Um, he's not that enamored of it to be honest, but you know, he uses it to connect with his parents. Um, (laughs) actually he talks more to me on Facebook sometimes, so that's good. Um, and I've got an 11 year old, um, he's not, I haven't allowed him on it yet at all. Um, one just, I think that that's an honesty thing that those sites say 13, so we get with that. Uh, but I do think that there is a sense in which you need a developed brain in order to use social media. Um, and a lot of the things that I would say about how I use social media, I think require, um, you know, a certain age and maturity and we need to shepherd our children through that. I mean, so actually I've allowed my 13 year old on um, as a way of, he's my friend, he has to be my friend and, and we talk about his social media experience. So I think it's one of those things where And I like that with everything with my children, I think. I like to um, be careful in introducing them to things, but also not sort of create sort of, you can't do this, because I think that becomes an unhelpful dynamic with your children as well. So the same as we would watch particular TV programs and would um, talk about them afterwards together, um, I find, I think social media usage has to be done like that as well. Um, The thing that I think is really difficult with children is cyberbullying. Neither of my children have experienced that. But particularly friends of mine with teenage girls have found that a major problem. Um, And um, I think that's something that we need to be thinking about a lot as uh, parents and as Christians. And I don't necessarily have the answers to that at this point in time. Yeah, I I agree pretty much completely. Uh, I have very young children. So I have one-year-old twin boys and a -a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter. So it's not particularly relevant in terms of social media, but what is relevant is screen time. And we do occasionally, we don't have a television in our living room, but we do have a television in mine and Ashley's bedroom. And we do occasionally put our daughter in front of, um, you know, a show or a movie while we're trying to get work done on the farm uh, while the boys are asleep or something like that. Um, And, of course, when you allow her to watch it, she wants to watch it as well. So you then have to learn to say no. And you have to, she has to learn to accept no. And that's a process and we do that. But I think that's what, it taps into a larger problem around the use of technology with children. Um, Screen time is a huge issue. I remember 
when I was made redundant from that job in 2016, I did about three months of work, uh, volunteer work afterwards during my redundancy pay with Together for Humanity, the sort of multi, uh, multi-religious uh, organisation. Uh, and we were speaking in schools. And the first ever session that I ran uh, or was part of running was a meeting between three schools. It was a public school in a largely Christian area, a Muslim school and a Jewish school. And the kids from, I think, year eight were getting together. And we had to get them in groups and there was a bunch of questions for them to answer. And um, one of the questions was, how do you eat in your house? How do you eat? And one of the Muslim students talked about, you know, we eat together and they talked about Ramadan and blah, blah, blah. And it was, you know, great and really eye-opening for the students. And then a Jewish student talked all about the different Jewish uh, rituals and festivals and how they always eat together and blah, blah, blah. And then one of the um, Anglo students, not necessarily a Christian, I'm not sure, uh, said, oh, well, uh, we just we just eat in our rooms. Uh, presumably on a screen. I mean, we, we need to think about those aspects of technology more widely. And I'd agree with Megan as well that one of the issues I think we have is that you, according to the terms and conditions of Facebook, you can join when you're 13. That is like the worst time to join. <laughs> I mean, in many ways, because your, your brain is not fully developed nowadays until you're 25 because of sociological and biological processes. Um, we don't actually have fully developed brains until 25 at this point in time. Now, up until that time, there's all sorts of forces going on, both biological, uh, but also social for young people. And envy is a huge one of those. Um, uh, you know, I've worked with high schoolers, not, not anymore, but I have for years. And uh, there's all sorts of issues around envy and self-esteem and, you know, all those things we all have heard about. Um, and then we throw them into this place where you create, basically, you're tempted to create a false identity where you present only the good. I mean, the damage can be significant to young people. Um, the bullying that can go on online, it can be brutal. And um, we, I think we need to, I, I don't know that we ha- either of us have any simple answers to this. There are none. But we do need to think clearly about what we're going to do with our kids when we have them and how we, you know, how they interact with technology and social media uh, and all that stuff. So there's a yeah, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. It's a good question. I I suspect I'll be holding it off as long as possible. But you can't really stop kids um, from getting on. They're allowed to, and and all the rest. And so you do have to, in some ways, just manage it. Mm. Yeah. And I I think what I've wanted to do is to have my sons see what I do on it as a way of like you always want to model, don't you? Um, and I try and model that fairly imperfect presence that I have. Um, I want to pick up on the thing about screen time because this is something I find really interesting in how we talk about social media and screen time. Because I find what I used to do when I had a moment to spare and I couldn't be bothered doing something actually important is I'd like play Minesweeper or something, right? But now I'll go onto Facebook. I just think that sometimes it's better play Minesweeper because it's actually relational and I sometimes look at my children if they're doing screen time and I'd rather they want social media where they're related to people than whatever they're doing which often is like my eldest is like reading Hansard which you know is good but really I'm not sure what great modelling is getting there um so you know that we need to differentiate how we understand the screens is what I'm saying yeah I think that there's something to that I wouldn't assume that all relationality is necessarily positive. So we just have to be careful that we don't assume because people are relating that therefore it's positive. Um, and I, I don't think that's what you're saying. But no. if, you know, it could be, you no. could be understood to be saying that. So um, that's that's something to take into account. I'd also suggest that, look, uh, Minesweeper, I'd be happy for my kids to play Minesweeper. You know, there's nothing wrong with um, games. It's all, It's with anything. It's the overuse of those kinds of things. Um, it's the overuse of screens. It's the overuse of social media. It's the overuse of games. Uh, it, it, in light of our um, ozone situation in Australia, it's the overuse of going outside. I mean, you know, everything can be overdone. So, yeah. I mean, I think well, I've got boys, so they're much more likely, I think, to overuse. Um, and and these 
there's nature and nurture and all that kind of thing, but they're much more likely at the moment to overuse games than to overuse doing something relational. Um, like we have a classic thing in our family where, which we laugh, we were like, get off your small screen and come and watch a big screen with the family, you know? But there is a point to that, like, because that's a relational use of the screen, which we're finding preferable to do that as a family than everyone being on the small screen. So in and of itself, still, we should not only be relating through screens, that's problematic. But but yeah, it, it, it's a complicated place, I think. Yeah. And and that's uh, there's something to that about finding alternative activities um, and offering them and knowing that kids won't always accept. But uh, giving your kids other options than just what their friends are doing or what seems default in our culture uh, or cultures, mm. to be more precise. Um, I mean, for me, our kids are young, so it's not as difficult at this point in regards to this these kinds of issues. But I am preempting it, and one of the ways I've preempted it is that mm. I have a fairly significant board game collection because there's something about having an analog thing on a table that you all have to sit around and you have to touch things on a table uh and and play mm. games like that and that's what the adults in in our sort of household do ashley and i play board games all the time rather than being on screens rather than watching tv constantly or anything like that and um, when people come over especially certain members of my family who are like where's your tv i'm like uh we you're not going in our bedroom. That's weird. So uh, there is none. <laughs> and uh, you can play a board game and we sit around a table and we have a yarn and we play a game. I mean, that's one example. We're on a farm too, so our kids are outside all the time, although it's pretty cold up where we are this time of year, so less so. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Look, just on relation, in relation to kids, David Cook says, um, the data shows uh, that Facebook is an old person's game now and many people under 25 or maybe 30 don't want to be there. It's daggy. Uh, unfortunately, for those of us who are older and have kids, uh, we have to become literate in newer social media platforms so we know where they are and what they're doing once we've set the boundaries for them. Uh, I mean, probably the big ones, uh, I think I'm not wrong in this, uh, are Instagram and Snapchat. Um, uh, yep. If you don't know what they are, <laughs> use another uh, big corporation service and Google them. And uh, <laughs> But uh, basically, Instagram is a photo sharing site owned by facebook by the way but uh and snapchat mm. i think is also owned. no i'm not sure who owns them uh but it's basically a, a video and and uh photo sharing uh platform where the things are deleted uh soon after you post them so they don't last forever uh, one of the big issues with that is that it um there's all sorts of uh risque <laughs> activities that happen there and people think that they're, you know, they're being deleted, but obviously um, it's never that simple. Um, my um, nieces actually are not on Facebook, they're on Instagram and they follow me on Instagram and it just, you know, I like put up a drink, an alcoholic drink and my nieces are liking it and I'm like, ah. <laughs> So it's an interesting environment. Um, yeah, that's where kids are, Instagram. And I find Instagram a really it, – it, it is much more likely to be fake um, and visually and about giving that perfection. Um, and it's much it, – it's so less text-based that it, I find it's, it's less engaging in that way. So I actually find Instagram – I use it. But I think it's quite concerning that kids are wanting to go there rather than somewhere where they can have um, a much bigger – uh, conversation with each other but one thing I've yeah. noticed is that of course people get older and I would like to see some data because what, what I see is um, people who are uh, as they get older then they go on to something more like Facebook but when they're a teenager they find Instagram something more attractive so I think sometimes there's a progression and it's just such early days that we can't see what the progression is but possibly there's a progression through different types of social media as well um, but, yeah, I would recommend parents be on Instagram and see what their kids are doing and understand it because, yeah, that is where they are at the moment. Yeah, you know, I think it's definitely worth – I think that's right. I think it's definitely worth signing up and having an account. Um, not simply – you don't want to helicopter your kids, right? Like, I mean, you don't want to spy on them. That, uh, that's – there's all sorts of issues there. But yeah, just yeah. to understand the technology and understand how it works. I mean, as you say, Instagram is way less text-based, way – I mean, it's it's – photos with some little comments underneath. Um, I think that does mm. reveal a lot about what kids are looking for. Uh, a lot of children are looking for, I should say, mm. with um, 
with social media, not really, not necessarily deep relational connection in the same way that we might be, um, but certainly oh. connection in another way. And Instagram can oh. be, it, it, it can go on a spectrum from being completely harmless to being pretty harmful. I mean, some accounts are just people who, you know, quite oh. beautiful people who share photos and try to say, this is the real me, but actually it's such a doctored, uh, profile, yeah, and it can easily lead to people feeling incredibly bad about themselves. So again, it's just yeah. understanding the technology and working out whether a you're in a position to say no to your kids, and if you're not, uh, if they're old enough or whatever, to say, all right, well, how do we use, how do you use these things uh, safely? I mean, it really is a matter of safety in a lot mm. of ways. So. And again, that literacy that I was talking about, being able to talk to your kids about what, what what's actually behind these images on Instagram and yeah. what else is happening in those people's lives and how are they being manipulated and so on. Like, I, re- I think that's such a key parenting thing in so many ways, not just social media, saying instead of being like the big sort of putting the walls around them, of going, okay, let's just discuss and discuss. Like my, parent, my kids actually get sick of how much I talk. You can understand that now having seen me on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, like, I think that, that they're actually quite engaged kids and, and, and quite cluey now as to what's happening with various things around them. And I think that at some point they're going to reject your control um, and, and try and make decisions for themselves. And so much better to be talking it through and, and helping them be literate um, and good citizens in, in all those different communities that they're in. Yeah, I think, frankly, the best strategy might just be to introduce your children very early to LinkedIn and they'll never want to touch social media uh, ever again. So that's definitely the best way to do it. Um, so that would be a really early um, red wine taste. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're discussing things about alcohol for exactly. years ago. Uh, David Cook uh, says, you'll reap the rewards of limited screen time, Matt. My kids have had minimal screens and now they are very creative and do lots of imaginative play without parental input and we can do a three hour drive without any entertainment and just chat the whole way. It's simply wonderful. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, look again, your kids are older than mine cookie and I, I don't have the experience that you do, but <clears throat> certainly with my daughter, she's two and a half. She, she has really for her age, really good vocab and um, she speaks really well. So we can actually interact with it really, really well. And um you know, in the car, there was a time, especially when the twins were young, where we would give her a phone with Hey Dougie, which is her favourite show, um, because we just mentally couldn't deal with all the crying and all the commotion. But now it's <laughs> now it's sort of plateauing a bit. And I've we've been saying no to her most like almost entirely when she asks for it. And she's kind of just forgotten about it. And it's great because we throw one of her kids' CDs on and she just sings songs and um, and it's really lovely when she's in the back just singing Ba Ba Black Sheep or something um, and, you know, singing every second word but uh, and just making it making it up as she goes. It's, it's I, I love it. Um, way, you know, whereas if she just had a screen, she'd just be sitting there like this and I'd be worried about a whole bunch of aspects of that and also not interacting with her. So, I, I, I yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It's funny, isn't it? It's like um, it's management of it as well. Like we, because parental sanity is an important thing, right? As you're saying, like sometimes you just need the sanity, right? Um, and long drives, and also you don't want to crash because your kids are driving you crazy. But um, I remember we, I would always would keep remote control of the the car DVD because I just had a real thing that kids need to notice cows and things like that. Yeah. Like <laughs> I was brought up that we noticed every cow that we saw so like whenever i thought right that i i would just like uh stop it and go hey kids look the cows but they thought i was insane but especially <laughs> was, when you've driven past child, it. Child, you've, you've already driven past it and they're like what cow <laughs> what ca- mom's crazy one of my children <laughs> one of my children's in the background he's just laughing his head off now so he must be remembering <laughs> um that, that interaction <laughs> um but yeah there is like Kind of work out for your family how you're going to do that, I think, rather than like, sometimes there's hard and fast rules, and I'm such not a hard and fast rule person, but kind of go, how are we going to um, manage this in a way that works for us in terms of the type of children we have as well, I think. Yeah, look, there's always a, a, a large amount of discernment to do 
in our own cases. And mm. that, that's everything from should I use social media? Is Am I the kind of person who should use it? Um, mm. You know, all the way to what do we do with our kids in the car? Like there's a lot of – but <laughs> in saying that, we don't want to also just be so, oh, just do whatever you think. You know, there is a sense that um, we do have to find um, – the wisdom of others and we do have to find um, oh. certain standards that we meet in the in the kind of practices we expect of ourselves as people who follow Jesus so it's all it's a mix of all of them and that's what makes it so difficult I'm sure there are people on this w- webinar who are yeah. going can you just give like clearer answers to these things seriously one <laughs> sentence just what do I do and uh, you know unfortunately it doesn't work like that what you need to do is follow me on all my social media accounts yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's right that's right. So, well, uh, there's no more questions in the chat at the moment, although people, you're welcome to add some. I want to ask you a, a question, Megan. I, um, you talked a bit yep. about how we, you know, we, we discipline ourselves and how we manage ourselves and the way we relate to other people mm. um, and the fact that, yeah, there's certain statistics and they're there and we have to be cognizant of them. But <clears throat> the reality is we can we have to just, we have to you know work it out for ourselves and and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, I I don't disagree, but I just want to you know I'm sure you've heard of the Dunbar principle whereby we can only uh, er, uh, so so this Dunbar person says we can only have meaningful relationships with about 150 people. Like that's for the average person. That's about right. Um, and the implication I think for social media is really interesting because I I think. I think Dunbar is probably about right. Um, and mm. one of the reasons I think where there's so much hate speech on social media is because you're now connected to way more people than maybe we're even meant to be connected to in some ways. Um, just in terms of a human's ability to relate to people, we simply can't relate to, you know, I have, I have 1800 or so friends on Facebook. Um, there's, that's, that's, mm. that's more than, you know, more than 10 times what I could possibly relate to in, in, properly in real life um and Mm. i think the the effect is maybe that we end up just rather than having meaningful relationships with people we end up just throwing arguments at people because we've kind of exceeded our limit in a way um i mean how do you think those larger forces of social you know you can talk about personal responsibility and i completely agree with you but that there is surely a limit to that responsibility where actually the, the cards are stacked against the responsible person. Wow, that's really interesting. Just some of the way that you perceive that is quite different from how I perceive it, and yeah. I think that kind of difference is really important. Um, one thing I wanted to agree with you with was I personally set up who I see first in my feed on Facebook, mm. and I, I do privilege certain things. So I privilege someone who I'm going to have day-to-day offline connections with. I privilege people who live in the same city as me um, because that for me, being able to develop a, a bigger relationship, I privilege my family. Um, I privilege people who I've made a really solid connection with that I go, I think maybe God's in this relationship, you know. So I, I manage that. Um, and I, I think that's really important to kind of go, yes, I've got limited time, but who, who, who am I being directed to spend that time with? And I think things like proximity, um, ministry and all that kind of thing. You, you need to work out what your ways of being able to do that are. So that that's one thing I agree about. That solid, uh, real, deep relationships. Yeah, you. It, it, there's a limit. However, perhaps my perception is different, and maybe this is a personal difference. That I have like 1,200 Facebook friends and interact with a broader community than that, and I never see someone as not a person. Um, and I make a deliberate choice to see them as a person. So when I'm interacting with people online, they're not some, for that moment. So it, it might not be an ongoing um, relationship past there, but for that moment, I'm in relationship with them. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, and in that moment, I'm determined to, to reperson them. Um, but I'm not sure, I mean, it might be that for some people, that's something that they find themselves unable to do. It might, I, I don't know, it could be something particular to my personality. And maybe that's why I see this as a place that I can administry in that I'm, and, and, and with the 1,200 people on my, my friendship list, um, kind of, and maybe this is from being a pastor, I had to keep lots of people's lives in my head. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, that person, I know that they're having a problem in their life at the moment. 
Um, so I'm just really aware that there is it's like a tip of an iceberg and, and there's a real person and a whole life and other family relationships and all kinds of relationships connected with that person. And so even if it's someone that I haven't met before, I'm cognizant of that in every uh, interaction with them. Um, and, and I kind of have an eschatological kind of focus to that, that particularly when they're Christians, I think this is someone who I am going to have some kind of relationship with in the future because we've got eternity and we'll be able to have a lot more relationships than we currently have time for. And so I think I am going to treat this as my first glimpse of that relationship. My, my, whether we never connect again, this is, this is the first little taste of that eternal relationship that I'm going to have with that person. Um, and that for me is an exciting thing. So my, my uh, sort of, uh, count, not counter, my um, response to that is to say, I like you a lot and you're a good person. <laughs> yep. So it makes sense to me <laughs> that you would take that approach. But you know, you've, also, you've also been formed by 40-something years of, uh, you know, uh, you know, whatever kind of Christian discipline and formation you might have had and all the rest. Yeah. Uh, you've yeah. been a pastor and so, you know, you've gone through the yeah. formation that's required for that. You know, the average person hasn't gone yeah. through any of that. Um, do, do you yeah. worry, though, that for you, you might have developed the kind of discipline you need to engage on social media, but do you worry that the environment itself is going to be shaped by millions of people who don't bother with any of those kinds of things? Like, is the Dunbar principle yeah, so meaningful at that point? Am I tilting at windmills? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, I think, and that's what I said, I think that's part, we need to do social media formation amongst Christians. I actually had a weird thing happen recently where um, someone I interacted with on Facebook um, then did a, a sermon on Facebook and social media and tribalism. And I, I went to listen to it because I was interested and discovered he'd used me as an illustration, which is kind of awkward, um, but positive. But actually, I was quite impressed that this person, that this um, male pastor, that he was deliberately not shying away from that as something he needed to form his, uh, his congregation in. And um, he was using real examples, even though he hadn't asked me about <laughs> interactions he'd had on social media. Um, and, um, yeah, I didn't hide my identity that well. But yeah, um, yeah. So this is a story about someone. I've changed their yeah, name. I, Let's call them Meg. <laughs> <laughs> We're just using first names. But if you were connected to the evangelical community, you go, I remember that conversation and yeah. how that blew up. Uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Look, I think we need to be okay with that transparency. But... Um, yeah, that really is. Yes, we need to accept that formation. We need to do that. Um, and that's why I write about social media. That's why I'm doing this webinar. That's why um, I am who I am on social media. I don't think it's for everyone, but I think that it is, is here to stay. And so we can't just, we have to do that kind of preparation for people. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Look, we're getting pretty close to seven. Uh, there's no more questions in the chat. Uh, so if you've got a last question now, would be the time. I'm not sure if you have any questions for me, Megan. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, I guess, do you, like, would you go off social media completely in the future? Like, what what is your end kind of place? Because you're on it at the moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you envisage being your future um, position towards or posture towards it? Yeah. Um, I Like, it's a good question. And I have no idea. Um, clearly, even, I mean, I'm sort of playing up the bad cop aspect of it a bit um, in this <laughs> webinar, but not by much, really. Yeah, like, like I am super negative about it, um, but I still use it. Um, you know, it is a way to connect with people. As I said, I've met you. I met Simon Moyle on Facebook. I met a whole bunch of other people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. And now we're like really good friends in 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 offline life. I don't know if real life is necessarily mm. a good way to put it because uh, social yeah. media is real. It's and often, hot, yeah. and often we can con you know convince ourselves it's not real, and then therefore you know might do harm because of that anyway um that's well, right yeah I, I do use it i do as, as we've talked about i do think it's a powerful tool um for all sorts of things that you want to say 
Love Makes a Way, I don't think, mm. could have existed without social media. Um, mm. I mean, certainly there would have been some mainstream media attention for a while, but not not mm. ongoing. Um, not you know, the, the the story comes to an end at some point. So, but would I ever go? Look, I I, I admit I do frequently fantasize about just turning off all my accounts because <laughs> I do recognize the way that it can be harmful for my life and for the lives of other yeah. people. Yeah. Do you recognize when I take missteps on social media? And for me, usually that takes mm. the form of being um, too hard in my arguments against people um, because mm. I'm the kind of person who just, I don't like bullcrap um, and I just sp- I speak <laughs> straight. And that doesn't always come across mm. kindly on Facebook, even if I intend it to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know. That's an aspect of it. So I know I can harm other people sometimes, and I know it harms me. I know it harms the way that I interact with others. Um, it is. I really feel like not just Facebook, but your smartphone in general is like having a slot machine in your pocket sometimes, and you just <laughs> you're constantly pulling it out to get. It's 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 mostly unconscious, but you get a dopamine hit um, mm-hmm. from a notification or from even a text message, whatever. Um, so it's not just social media. I frequently fantasize about getting a dumb phone. So mm. will that mean I, I get, well, I, you know, I get off it. I, it'll depend. It'll depend mm. on what happens with the platforms themselves, what direction they go in. Do they really care about uh, protecting the data of people and trying to find ways to mm. um, combat hate speech and uh, fake mm. news and all this kind of stuff that is really harmful to mm. Uh, the, the the collective politics of our of our societies. Um, if they don't, if and if it gets worse, then I might have to say, have to really think about it. But I think what you said earlier about, you know, should we delete Facebook? If if it's for data reasons, the fact is most of the yeah. data you're going to share has already been shared, uh, unless you, <laughs> you know, deleting it's not getting rid of. You're not erasing your data, folks. Uh, it's there. It's yeah. forever. It's forever, forever. Uh, except you know, yeah. until God restores all things and deletes all data. But um, yeah, like well, it makes every data accessible to everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. All the data will be shared from the rooftops. He'll just tweet it all <laughs> out. <laughs> no secrets anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that thing you said, it's going to get shared. So, um, but. <laughs> I don't think that's a good reason to delete Facebook. Is it because yeah. um, you want to say no to these big bad corporations? Well, it's kind of like selling your shares, right? You no longer have an ability to speak mm. to that platform. You no longer are a customer. Yeah. So you, they don't actually care what you think anymore. So I, we yeah. actually need to have alternative movements, collective movements that will say no to these things, and we're seeing that happen. I hope that I can be a mm. part of those movements and see these platforms become more neutral. Now, like I said, technology mm. always embodies values. It's never neutral, so it never will yep. be, and it'll always embody values that I don't like. But yep. I think that I can make certain certain compromises. Not, I'm not going to compromise everything, but I can make certain mm. compromises to continue to engage on social media to a point, and I don't know exactly where that yep. point is and whether we'll get there, but that's really a long non-answer. <coughs> but... <laughs> But that's sort of my thoughts on it. I think actually a lot of what you said there, I would completely agree with actually. Um, I probably have to have a point that's in a different point from you to where I would refuse to engage with it. Um, but obviously there has to be a point that something is just the harm that's producing is more than the good that you have from continuing to engage. I've got people about to come, so thank no, you, you everyone yeah. for being here. Sorry? You, you need to go, yeah. Yeah, I've got people about to come because we're watching the Royal Wedding with people. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and eating cake. Um, that's the kind of crazy thing I do, and I'll probably be Facebooking it too. Uh, for anyone who is on this webinar, if you want to connect with me online or offline, feel very free. Yeah, I'd love to connect with you and talk more. Yeah, great. And I have love meeting Matt as well. I should say that. And if you want to see <laughs> Megan's live Facebooking messages on the Royal Wedding, head to her Facebook profile right now. 
It ought to be. <laughs> That'd be so good. <laughs> yeah, it will, it'll be pretty funny. Um, I have absolutely, I have less than zero interest in that topic, so I won't be on there, but uh, <laughs> feel free. Look, there's just a couple of things. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm still getting over a cough. Um, there's just a couple of things I just want to um, point towards. One is um, our friends, the Bruderhof, um, they, re- they, their magazine Plow, uh, their winter issue, which is summer for us, uh, was recently about all kinds of, all issues tech. Uh, it really is excellent. Um, so, I mean, I would encourage you to sign up for Plow anyway. You know how amazing they are? Their magazine that they send to you as a hard copy is free. Um, oh, wow. Amazing community of people. Um, so get on, uh, uh, you can uh, subscribe to Plow, but it's all online for free as well. And so the, if you look up uh, Staying Human uh, Plow on uh, uh, your preferred search engine, uh, you'll be able to find this Staying Human with all the different um, articles. And there's some really great stuff there. So I encourage you to read that. Are there any resources you'd point people towards, Megan? Actually, I um, didn't want to do this thing with sharing the screen because I was worried about my connection, but uh, one of the communities of women that I mentioned was Fixing Her Eyes. And um, to any women out there who want to connect with uh, some really important uh, Australian Christian female voices that are saying things, I think that often no one else is saying or institutional voices aren't saying, Fixing Her Eyes is the place to go. Just Tammy, who was on before, she's another writer for them. And I really, really, really make, recommend them. And they've got a Facebook group and they've got a website. Um, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So there it is, folks. Um, I don't know. I'm just loading it up now. Oh, thank you. her eyes. So that's the website. They've got a Facebook group. Um, definitely check that out. Um, look, Megan, thanks so much for your time and for all that you've shared. Um, there's a lot in there. And, and of course, there's a lot not. Uh, we haven't been able to say everything. And so if you came to this conversation and didn't get an answer to something, I apologise. Um, there's so much more that could be said and I'm hoping that I can get you in front of a camera one day and we can just have a yarn about this thing to put on the internet somewhere. Um, but yep. thanks for being with us. Thank you for inviting me and thank you everyone for being present as well. Don't worry. That's right. Thanks everyone for coming. See you later. Uh, this will go online soon if the recording worked out. So I'm not confident because this is new software. <laughs> we'll see how it goes, uh, but I, you'll get a notification hopefully that it that it that it does. Uh, and <laughs> make sure that you sign up. Uh, you you like our Facebook page because uh, we have that. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> also head to our website and subscribe to our weekly mailing. But that's it from us. Uh, thanks for coming, and we will see you next time.